So hello to everyone watching uh, both now and in the future with the recording. Um, it's great to have you here for the second in our Zero Waste Month interview series. Um, this one is all about community empowerment, and we are really excited to talk with some organizations who are experts in community involvement, community engagement, and really fighting for zero waste policies, zero waste, uh, a zero waste ethic, and climate justice as well. So we'll see the nexus of all of those things. My name is Hayden Sloan. I'm the Strategic Director of Communications for Race to Zero Waste, your host today. Um, and we are really excited to get started. So, oh, and I use she, her pronouns. So we'll get started with names, uh, pronouns, and a little bit about the organization uh, for each one of our guests today. So Steph, you wanna take it away? Hey everyone, <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. Hayden, I'm Stephanie Compton and I use she, her pronouns. Um, Energy Justice Network is a national organization um, that works to support frontline communities living with incineration. And so I do live in Baltimore and support the network locally through the Clean Air Baltimore Coalition. Okay, great. Uh, so next I'll have Shoshanda. Hi everyone, I'm Shoshanda Campbell with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Um, and we work on primarily affordable housing um, development without displacement and also looking to turn um, communities that have been used as a sacrifice zone or dumping ground um, back into thriving communities, right? Um, and make sure that they're not being polluted anymore. So we work on a lot of those types of issues. And my pronouns are she and her. Great, okay, last one, Young. Hello, and I'm also in the waiting room on my laptop if you wanna do a horizontal. Gotcha. Um, and we can jump over. All right, so we'll get Young in just a second. There we go. There, here I am. Um, as you can see in the logo, or in the little name, which I'm gonna rename myself, um, I work for the Post Landfill Action Network. My name is Young and I use they them pronouns. We work with colleges and universities on zero waste initiatives, but have particularly um, created a program in the Ohio River Valley where we're also working with the community to resist uh, the petrochemical build out up there, here, up here, where I am. And inspiring others in other places as well. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, well, the first question that we have for you is kind of building on the the idea of the the nexus between zero waste and what your organization does. So the whole idea of zero waste month is finding actions that our audience can do. So hashtag zero waste action, hashtag zero waste month. Uh, you may have seen some folks sharing some of those actions. Um, and we really want to bring in like the, the idea that zero waste is bigger than putting something in the recycling bin, right? And so that's part of why we're talking with y'all today. And so if you could talk a little bit about how zero waste plays into what your in, uh, organization does, we would love to hear that. Um, Young, you want to go first? Yeah. So plan... Um... We work with like colleges and universities on all things related to zero waste really. So um, we've helped folks, we started as like a move out program where we collected gently used goods at the end of the school year, resold them at the beginning of the next year as a way to reduce like the, the waste that comes on college campuses with those like cheap products that you get, um, like a cheap lamp, right? Um, that usually gets thrown away. Um, and now we do so much more. So we um, have also helped campuses do compost, um, to um, eliminate single-use plastic. That's what I work on particularly. Um, and a lot of it is based on just like really um, empowering the students to be the leaders of that work on campus because for it to be effective, the students have to show that it's something that they want. Um, you know, like the school is operating for them. They go to the classes. So if they ask for what they want and if they want zero waste, it's something that, um, usually we're able to, to push for with them. That sounds great. We love getting students involved. We recently got a grant to start a, a little bit of a reuse coalition with student involvement as well. So maybe we can talk offline about that too. <laughs> love to hear about it. Um, Shoshanda, you wanna go next? Yeah, I, uh, 
in the organization in South Baltimore Community Land Trust, we really think of zero waste as solution to really combat a lot of what we see in our communities already, which is a lot of polluted industries. Um, how do they get there? Why are they there? Like, uh, for example, looking at incinerators, like in landfills in our communities, most of our, all of our trash really go to those two this different places, right? Um, but we know what's in it don't have to be burnt or buried, such as food waste, uh, which we worked with Plan, aka Young also, um, with some of the universities to look to like what they already are like producing and what they're already sorting. Um, and how do we get that to actually create a compost facility in Baltimore that can address the 40% of food waste in the waste stream currently? Um, it just makes sense, you know, but when you have a city that all they have is an incinerator and a landfill, everything looks like it should be burnt or buried. Um, and so it's really hard really making that just transition to zero waste because it's really not only a mindset shift for like residents and for people um, on the ground, um, it's a mindset shift for like government, right? Um, because it's not something that they're doing right now. And a lot of places are trying to combat that. Um, and so we see zero waste as a solution to really step away from this mindset and this system of burning and burying everything you touch. And then also looking at what's, our, what's being produced and how do we limit certain things like single use plastics, which is designed for the end result of the end disposal of being burnt or buried, right? We shouldn't be producing that. It takes too much to produce that, too much natural resources to then burn it or bury it and put it into the air where people are breathing it in. Um, so we really see zero waste as that type of solution and not just like recycling because this is not a problem we can recycle our way out of. Um, so we really see it as a transition. Yeah, I think you hit on some really important points that I hope to get into in depth a little bit more uh, later, um, especially that movement from a community grassroots movement into like actual change, policy change, getting governments to listen, um, really hoping to, to hit on some of those points. And yeah, the recycling is not a solution. It's definitely a mantra that we go on and on about because as you've seen, probably if you've heard anything about zero waste is there's that percentage that 9% of all the plastic produced in the world has ever been recycled. And clearly that is not a solution. Completely agree. Uh, Steph, you want to talk about your organization and then we'll get into depth. Sure. So uh, locally in Baltimore, we work on policies and strategies to shut down the city's largest stationary air polluter, the trash incinerator. So we work on zero waste policy and organizing stakeholders for deconstruction ordinance. And so that targets like a significant portion of the waste stream coming from homes and buildings. So we've been um, working on a policy for that. And that requires a lot of outreach and education to city leadership and to the business stakeholders there. Um, and ultimately working on the careful dismantling of those homes and buildings for reuse and getting those um, resources staying in the circular economy and replacing the destruction of our resources through demolition and ultimately replacing it with deconstruction is one of the policies that we do. Um, we're also researching the connection of the trash incinerator that it has with the district steam loop. And so that is another education project doing the research and we just produced a fact sheet earlier this year. Um, so it, it connects the underground pipelines that much of the city uses for steam and it's literally underground. So a lot of folks don't know about it. So we're bringing it up, up to the, the front. Um, and so understanding that if we put the pressure on the city and the company to pressure them to electrify the steam loop, that we can stop utilizing the stream that's purchased from the trash incinerator. And that's another angle at fighting the closing of the incinerator. You said that's called the steam loop? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. Steam loop. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I would love to hear from all of you, whoever wants to go first and feel free to play off each other, jump in, um, you know, ask questions to each other. I'm really glad to have this conversation between organizations as well to learn uh, not only for our audience, but with each other as well. Um, so yeah, let's, um, let's get into a little bit of that community building aspect. So starting with um, kind of the grassroots effort, which is also what we talked about last week with our uh, Zero Waste Month interview. And if anybody wasn't able to catch that, it's also recorded on YouTube. Um, so yeah, let's talk about it. So community, how do, how do you get people involved? How do you get people on board? How do you convince people? Whoever wants to take it away. I'll start first. Um, 
I think that, so when I got started in this work that we do, I started in high school, right? I started with a group called Free Your Voice that we helped, that we formed in Ben Franklin that took down an incinerator, right? And that was a really big win for the community because, you know, it didn't have any wins, you know? Oh, um, and then there was this next, this other proposal to build another incinerator, even though we already have that incinerator that's staff talked about the Bresco incinerator, uh, the Willowbreder incinerator, AKA now the wind incinerator. Um, you know, and it keeps changing this name, but we're still gonna call it grassroots. I've growing up into this from um, high school and working with youth to really like expand and amplify their voices um, to lead a movement. Um, I think it starts there, you know, it starts and it starts with like, for us, it started in schools. Um, it started with looking at our communities and working with these different people um, that we see in every day. And it also started with like health, right? So we didn't link it to all of these bad things yet. We just knew that it was a big problem. So we knew asthma was a really big problem in schools. So if you say we have asthma, 90% of the hands raised. Um, and then, you know, when going door knocking with people, you know, they say this is always happening. That's just the fate of this community. Um, and then pr like literally less than a mile from where our high school was, there were three communities. It was Fairfield, Wagner's and Hawkins Point. Those communities got polluted out. And so Curtis Bay is another community that could be polluted out. And so, you know, it's that fate that keeps people fighting. And that's where this movement really grew from. It grew out of knowing that like, if we don't do something now, there might not be a later in this community. Um, and it may not be a later for like people, like people are dying due to these systems that's put in place. Like there is two lives compared to a community, which is a, wealthy, uh, particular, particularly white community. Um, and 20 years, that's 20 years. You know what you can do in 20 years? You can probably, that could be the difference between seeing your kids get married. Um, and the fact that that has shaved off people's lives, that created this movement. And that's what keeps this movement going. It's people that breathe life into these movements. Um, and if people aren't willing to do it, it's not gonna happen. You know, we can fight for all these different policies, but if people aren't ready, it's not going to happen. And so we've been organizing through high schools, we've been organizing through colleges, we've been organizing through just residents on the ground, and we take what they want to see and what their envisioning is, and we fight for it. Um, and we're, we're their representatives. Um, every day, everything we do, we report back to them because they are bosses. Um, and we tell them, and they make real decisions. And so we give that power to people because that's where power really lands. Um, so that's what that's that's what a real grassroots organization looks like. That's what real grassroots organizing is. Even if it's something different from my personal perspective, I still have to go and ask for it because that's what people want. Uh, sorry, Steph. Well said, Shoshanda. Yeah, I think a little bit cut out too. Like she was talking about the comment of like the the twenty year discrepancy of life expectancy. That's what she's commenting on. I think a little bit of that cut out. But if we compare like some of our highest income communities or lowest income communities that are living near the incinerator, we're talking about a 20 year life expectancy difference. So I just wanted to like clarify that point. Um, and then I you know, education, that is the number one key to the movement because a lot of folks still don't even know living in Baltimore that we have an incinerator or what one is. So we have to do that constant education. And so it's engaging people and meeting them where they're at meeting them when they're at, and that's go, that's being in the community, going to public events. Um, I recently did a couple of public events where I set up like a three bin station, trash recycling compost, you know, let folks kind of like figure out which where they're gonna go and only intervene if they were gonna put it in the wrong place. And at that point, you know, I let them know like, hey, we're all learning here together. Like, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not, cause like I'm learning too, you know, even, even I'm an expert at what goes where and I'm still learning based off of what our local uh, government does. There's so many so, products. How can we know every single That is thing? the problem. Yeah, There's so exactly. many products. And it's even an expert, it's hard to keep up. And so yeah. that's why I know like the future is reuse and the future is like having like standards for that and keeping them all the same. We should we shouldn't have to work so hard to identify what is recycling and what is compostable. And so uh, doing those in, those like engagement opportunities are where I've I've learned a lot. I've learned what people know and then people and then luckily the one of the locations I was at had the incinerator in the background and I could actually be like there that thing we are starving that polluting incinerator because anything that goes in that trash can is going to go to burn and pollute our air and that's what we're aiming to stop by getting into the composting stream by getting into the recycling stream 
So that's the education that I've been able to participate in and, and produce fact sheets. Like it, it's, it's gotta be the education. You gotta bring the community on board. So that way, when we get to that infrastructure and those policies, the community is ready. We've been conditioned to make that switch. Yeah, I wanted to just like kind of kind of go off of, you know, what Steph said um, and around like the way that we we do the education of like folks and what this really is. But at the same time, they are putting out their own education saying that this is like green energy, right? So like, I feel like one of the biggest challenges is the fact that there are so many false solutions. So not only do we have to like fight what's bad, but like we have to also like try to explain why this is actually a false solution why it's like it's not waste to energy right which is like the the term that they like to use or like chemical recycling um there's so many different terms and it's all just incineration yeah can you talk a little bit more about that like there might be some folks in the audience who are like what false solutions Man, like, let's those get PR into campaigns it. are so good like watching like the wind waste, you know, formerly Bresco, formerly Liberator, like their PR campaign. I'm like, wow, that sounds really good. If I didn't know any better, I would think this waste of energy is a great idea. They do a really good job of selling their services. And they, they do a good job of reclaiming, recycling. Like they're reclaiming that. And I like, and when you're talking to people and they're like, Bres like the, the incinerator is doing recycling. They want us to do it, right? And we're like, no, baby, they're not doing recycling in a way we're trying to talk about, right? It's so different. Um, and then when you hear them say there's a solution for all the plastic, you just, it's called chemical recycling. Like you can get rid of that plastic without it. Like, it's just another way of saying we're going to burn it. That's literally all it is. Um, but, you know, it sounds good. When you put recycling on it, it sounds good. You can say it's chemical recycling. It sounds fancy. Um, and so it's really hard, you know, like when you have to do that type of like uh, education and then re-educating is what it feels like. Um, and then it's also hard in this different chicken and the egg thing when you have, when you tell people learn the material and then the, then the systems will come rather than like the systems and structure being there and then they can actually engage in it, right? Um, and so I just feel like, you know, like even in a city where it's not offering like composting in a real way, we teach people how to compost, which seems really weird, right? Because like they can't really do it in a real way because most people don't have a backyard to do backyard composting so we're just teaching them something inevitably that they're not going to use unless we can create structures that follows what the mindset is we're trying to teach people um and i think that that's the hardest thing to do because it's like challenging a city and fighting with them back and forth to do that yeah and i'll say like another like um insidious thing that these companies do is that they like tend to give back to the community so they'll like sponsor a baseball team and like you know uh pay for something for for the folks like pay for like water filters for them in this way where that's like painting them as this like hero of the community like we may be polluting them but we're also like contributing a lot but like it's it's just like a way to be able to you know hide behind a mask um and it feels like it's like I don't know it just feels like such an evil thing to do Yeah, I think that the idea of education and re-education and even experts have to constantly be re-educated because the recycling market changes. Um, sometimes things are accepted and in other places they aren't. And between location changes and time changes, everything changes um, with the recycling market. And then um, as we talked about um, like re-educating people, there are a lot of people who are really receptive to education, and that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you all about how you engage with skeptics or people who are in favor of uh, incineration as a waste to energy solution. Like somebody might say, we have so many plastics, like what are we gonna do with all of them? We might as well take advantage of the energy that's embedded in them and make some energy out of it at least rather than send it to landfill as if it's the only solution possible. So just wondering how you engage with comments like those and, and what you say to skeptics. I'm sure we're all chomping at the bit to attack this one, but I'll go ahead and, and get off with, you know, talking about anti-incineration. People are always asking, well, don't we need it? And so um, again, the PR is so good. So when I encounter skeptics, they usually ask, well, where would the trash go instead? So that's when we're, we get to the, the root of the solution. And that's like, well, we need to redesign 
all of these things that we're having to manage and like we shouldn't be burning and burying anything. Um, but if I had to, if I only had one choice, I would say, let's just go straight to landfill. But even that, if that was the only option, ultimately it's getting the, the redesign out. And so engaging folks on like why it is, why are we the, the community and the local governments having to be responsible for this end of life waste stream? Why is that something that's, that's responsible, that is on our responsibility? So I'll kick it off to you guys, whatever you all want to say. Yeah, I think just to follow that stuff, I think it's first a lot of times there's so it's, it's different groups that's going to be skeptical, right, um, that I feel is so like there's workers, for example, workers are like, I'm going to lose my job, right, and then you you go into the campaign of like, first of all, zero waste creates way more jobs, and then that's when we talk about a just transition for workers, um, you know, and we and it goes right back to education. A lot of people can't see that vision because they've been living in this reality for so long uh, where they've seen only trash get picked up and get burnt. They don't have to think about it. Um, and we're teaching people to think about your your waste, right? We're thinking, think about that that banana peel. You can't just throw it in a bin now with the rest of your plastic. Like you have to compost it or paper. You can't just throw it in a bin. It goes in recycling. So it's just like we're, teach, we're giving them that education to do the right thing. I think it's uh, really just creating that vision for them to be able to see it. Um, and I think it's also looking at wins. So wins around the world that's happening when the incinerators are closing and the world don't come crashing down. Like this, this guy still stands, like we still woke up, um, you know? And so it's this reliance that I think it is since we've had it for, for literally, for all of my life. So it's like, um, you know, teaching, showing them that these wins across the world that's happening around incinerators, around composting, around recycling, um, and these different initiatives of redesigning, um, to show them that it's, it, it's possible, you know. And then I'm sure you get people that also talk about, they do it so well in Germany. Germany has great incinerators. I'm like, it's the same. It's the same technology. They just, they've sold it a different way. It's still not great. It's still not something that we want. Um, but go ahead, Young, you're about to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, like, um, responding to skeptics, which was, like, the original question, is, like, first, I pick my battles, because, like, we only have so much energy. We don't have to convince everybody. Like, most people, I feel like, agree that, like, we don't want to be poisoning each other, and I feel like finding a place of, like, common ground is, I mean, you know, every environmentalist will tell you, um, to find a common ground with the person that's a skeptic, right? And be like, okay, what is one thing that we do agree on, right? We like want clean air, right? Like, let's say that we wanna do that and talk about like the ways in which we are contributing to that and aren't contributing to that. And like, honestly, it's like a, a complete different mindset that you have to show them and be like, okay, like imagine a world where waste is not there. Like, what does that look like to you? Explain it to me. Like see if you can even get your brain to think that and in that world like are things better than they are now like do we still have incinerators like probably not right because there is no waste um so I feel like it's a, like a lot of reframing a lot of finding common ground and like that sort of thing yeah I just um, wanted to really oh I'm sorry I just wanted ahead. to really like I agree so hard wholeheartedly on that picking the battles because like we're not gonna win them all. And like, while we, we're taking all the time to convince this person, there's someone over here that wants to know. <laughs> like, um, so, I, and, and protecting your peace in this, you know, because like, you don't have to prove that your community is dying to people. You don't have to prove that. Like, you know that, and they should just believe it. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna sit there in a room full of people that don't live in the communities and try to prove to them in their wealthy homes and their good lives that like people are suffering from pollution in there. And, and, and it's, it's literally them too. They're doing it. They're dumping all the communities. If you can't understand it, then that's that just makes you a bad human being. Because if I'm telling you that now you have the knowledge, do something different. Sorry. I love that idea of, uh, of visions that you both mentioned. Uh, Young and Shoshana both mentioned like envisioning a future or like creating, like helping someone, guiding them to the vision of a future where we don't have waste and we don't have incinerators. And what does that look like for our health, for our communities, um, for the earth, for the environment? Like there's so many ways that our waste just impacts everything around us. Um, and so hopefully bringing the community together to start creating that vision or, um, 
I'm making it happen, right? We get step one, visualize, right? <laughs> step two, figure out a way to like get people to listen. Step three, make some changes. So hopefully um, that's something that your community audience that y'all can do as well. If, uh, if you've got a robust zero waste system, great. It can always be better. If you've got nothing so far, um, start from zero, get your neighbors together, like see if you can create that vision that, uh, that Young and Shoshanda and Steph have been talking about. Amazing. Um, and then uh, I would like to go to the next question. Um, so keeping people engaged is kind of a question. So maybe people are really interested in the beginning and they say, wow, yeah, that's a great vision, right? Um, and then it's hard to do the work. So how do you keep people engaged and get people on board to really do the, the more grueling part of getting zero waste implemented? Okay, I can start with this one because like this is one of my favorite aspects of organizing and it's like this work has to be fun. Like if you are not having fun and if you're not, you know, building connections with your neighbors and like having a good time and like caring for each other, like why are you doing this? Find a different thing that you can do where you are having fun because I feel like, you know, and part of that is like creating something that is fun, right? So like having meetings that are around a bonfire or like making sure that there's always food and childcare, like doing things that will make this something that people want to be a part of, right? Like you wanna make a group where people are like, ah, I wanna be in that group because that looks like fun. Like that looks like fun. And that looks like something that I wanna be a part of. I wanna build that community with them. So I feel like that's like one of the main ways that I go about engagement. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think it's, you want to be that, you want to be just a sample of that community you're trying to build, right? Um, and I, I also think that like, you know, give them ownership. Like people need to feel like they have ownership over it too. So it's not like only me, like it's like when you come here, you you are having ownership over this. Like you got to make sure that this flows tomorrow, okay? Um, and I think that is also allowing people to really, I've learned, you know, when you tell somebody what to do, you know, like that analogy when you take, when you give somebody the fish they eat for a day, but when you teach them the fish they eat forever, right? So like when you're talking with people, we are learning to give them skills, right? Give them things and resources that they can actually work on this without your presence. So they can feel as though they're doing something more. And we always say that no role is too small, right? Um, people like to think you gotta have this gigantic role, right? But it's like, I respect people's time so much. So whatever time they give me, I feel like I, I've already won and this movement has already won because like, people don't have a lot of time, you know, they're racing, taking care of kids. We're working in communities of low income and of color. And like, we can't expect them to have time all day, every day. Like, gratefully, I get paid to do this. But like, you know, if everyone can get paid to do this, by all means, everyone can do this every day. But <laughs> until then, you know, we got to respect where people are and respect their time. Um, and anytime they can give to it and update people, giving them reassurance that things are still moving. Um, and that whatever part they have ownership over it, it's there, they, that still stands, right? That, that we still need them. We're not there. We don't like to make it seem like we have it all together because if we had it all together, we would see a different world. So it's like, we invite them to be a part of something and not be told what to do, uh, which is different, you know? Well said, <laughs> both of y'all. <laughs> so I just make myself available. I, I go to other community meetings. I show up, I want to see... I want to go to where the momentum already is and, and join in where the, the movement's already happening. And that's where I go to make my connections and then do my best to I have an email list and, you know, keep folks updated. And I learned how to do reels. So <laughs> that's how I keep folks engaged and show people what I'm working on and, and just keeping the inspiration, just keep walking the walk, keep doing the thing and engaging people everywhere I go. <laughs> How do you keep yeah. up the energy? Yeah. Also, one more thing is building trust with people. So, like, even as people that, like, they call me sometimes and it ain't got nothing to do with zero waste. <laughs> like, you know, like, I call people sometimes and I say happy birthday. So, it's like, it takes literally zero dollars and zero cents to actually care about people beyond this work because they are still human beings. So, like, normalizing having regular conversations with people in the community. Um, and, and it don't always have to be about this because this is hard. And so uh, trusting people and, and building a space where people trust you enough 
to call you beyond like the the incinerator is is back up, whatever it is. Like, but like to say like, hey, I'm having this event. Do you want to come? I have you invite me to that prom, okay? Like, <laughs> it's been a thing. So or weddings. And so these people become your family. That's so true. We're, none of us are one dimensional. So that's definitely something to recognize. Yeah. Um, Steph, how do you keep up the energy to, to engage with people? How do you like <laughs> good, good as organizers, question. like every, like every community needs somebody to be an organizer. Like how do we keep it up? Ugh, good question. I luckily am blessed at being an extrovert. So like I am just feeding off people at every opportunity. So just being in community is what feeds me. Like, I, and it's interesting too, I've reflected on this where like I was getting ready to go to the community meeting and I was kind of like low energy. I wasn't feeling up for it, but definitely knew I wanted to be there. And then afterwards I was just like, so like high on energy from all the connections I made and all the people that I talked to. Like, so that's just going out there like is what keeps me going. And there's just so much work to do. calling all extroverts <laughs> come be an organizer for zero waste i heard there was a lot of libras my birthday is coming up it's libra season so i heard there was a lot of libras in the environmental movement and in my last job that was definitely true i shared a birthday with a couple of people that's awesome all right libras and extroverts that's who we need to be our leaders <laughs> love it all right, awesome. Well, I will bring it to uh, a couple of uh, audience questions here. Um, so we have one question, which is, what is the biggest challenge getting community members involved in the zero waste or anti-incineration movement? So I know there are a lot of challenges, right? We have Everybody has a different challenge. But if you think about your work, your community specifically, what have you faced? What has been the biggest challenge in getting community members involved? Who wants to go first? <laughs> um, I would, I, um, the biggest part, so in my community, we are all community members, right? Whether we are residents or whether we're city leaders, uh, we're all in this community together. And so ultimately it's like, how, many people does it take to organize to prove to leadership that this is what we want and that's where i feel like the biggest obstacle is like we've been organizing in baltimore against the impacts on our health from the incinerator for years so how long how many people does it take for leadership to make the move necessary Yeah, and I think exactly that stuff is time, you know, it's time that people, people grow throughout this movement, right? People don't just stand still. So, and so, it, and, and it takes so long to see one change. It takes so long. Like when we were in the incinerator fight, that took five years, five years, you know what I mean? And so, and still in Baltimore, after all of this fighting, like we still have to fight for something so trivial as a compass. So even though we proved all these things, but so for instance, it was like prove health impacts are happening. And so then people proved that, you know, Chesapeake Bay came out with a, with a uh, report that said the incinerator cost $55 million a year in health damages, $55 million a year in health damages, one polluting industry. And then that wasn't enough. It still wasn't enough. And so it just seems as though people get tired. They get tired of fighting against the system that has broken trust so many times. And then they, they don't know who to trust. They don't know who to trust. Even in these officials that's supposed to be making change, um, they're not doing it. They're not doing it. And so it's really hard for to tell people to keep going when you don't even know, you don't even know what was at the end of the tunnel. You have to just believe that the light will be at the end of the tunnel, right? But it can just be incineration at the end of the tunnel sometimes. <laughs> like, but it's really, you know, it's it's sad, but it's true. And so we people have been fighting for for, for decades, even before we came along. And uh, we're still fighting for something so trivial, so trivial. Um, and so I think that's the hardest part is keeping people engaged for a movement that can last for so long. That's hard. Yeah. So if you're out there in the audience, like get ready to be in it for the long haul. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is an ongoing, it's the race to zero waste, but we say that the race to zero waste is a marathon, like a, like a super mar an ultra marathon. Yeah. So we're really like slogging through. And so welcome, please join in. <laughs> 
uh, run the race with us and and we'll support each other through it right go ahead young yeah i was gonna say like um like shoshana touched on it a little bit but like one of the challenging things is that like we 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 already see the impacts and they don't stop like we don't get to just like put a pause on like the destruction of health of like marginalized communities we like have to just like respond to that and then like when you factor in the fact that like when you factor in the fact when you factor in climate change and like the the different things that are happening related to that it's like there's a lot like there's a lot in our world and it just like kind of it doesn't stop you just have to like keep taking it so I think like resilience is a really important factor um and I guess that's what I would say is like the hardest thing all right well I'll follow that up with uh something that gives you hope because we all have challenges and it's rough I know <laughs> um but let's let's talk about something that gives you hope to like take the negative turn it into a positive thorns and rosebuds I don't know if y'all have ever played that kind of icebreaker game <laughs> uh well what gives me hope is like examples of zero waste that we can all do like and we're here talking about more than what the individual can do. We're talking about system change and that is the long haul, but we all make up the system, whether we are the individual or the person that runs a small business or the person that works for a corporation. So like it's all of these individuals communicating to each other the power that we have in each of these roles. And so that's my my inspiration is, is yes, like I am asking for each individual to do their part, but individuals are at these positions of power that can have influence. And so that's why I really like the power of composting in your backyard if you choose to, or if not, the power to taking it to the nearby community garden, drop it off, or the power to um, for a business to start investing in reuse, the power that businesses can have without having legislation. Yes, we need legislation. Yes, we need policies that make this change like mandatory, but at the same time, like there are things that the people in power that we can do to support this movement. Wait, I want I want Shoshanda to end us because I feel like you're gonna be really, really hopeful and you know, um, I wanna go in the middle. <laughs> um, uh, and I feel like I have like a really trite answer, which is young people, but like, and I also like am so, sort of still a young person, but like working with young people is great because you get to like watch them learn all of the organizing skills. Um, like not just the fact that like, you know, they're like bright eyed and bushy tailed, which sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, but just like watching them come into their own power, I feel like is really um, hopeful to me. Like someone who's like, I didn't know I could ask for this, right? And I'm like, you can, you know, like that. that's the hopeful part. Yeah, that was my answer. I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, working with youth. Youth is like, they really give you the information that like, you know, they are ready. And then like, they actually care about this, you know? And a lot of people try to write them off that like, they don't care, or like, this generation is so bad, but like, this generation is honest. Like, they they are reckless a little bit in the best ways. So <laughs> they're like, they're not gonna take no. Like, they're not, like, they're not as, as conservatives in that in that way. And so I, I respect them wholeheartedly and to see young people go up against like, at city council meetings and testify. Like, and they're testifying on behalf of not only themselves, but they're speaking for other residents. If that's not power, I don't know what is. Like for them to stand in the room and hold their own and feel empowered and that they have a community that stands behind them as the youngest people are part of this movement. That, that, if that don't give you inspiration, I don't know what the heck does. <laughs> like, it, it's like, that's a beautiful thing. And I think it also gives me hope to know that like, it's not only Baltimore, you know, like for, we do a lot of, you know, we're, we're sick in Baltimore that's where we live but um you know it's not only us so it doesn't make us feel so isolated it makes us feel that we're part of this network of people that's going through the same stuff but those people are also fighting back and so to like just broaden that view a little bit more it makes you hopeful because like somebody gotta win somebody gotta find a solution like it can't be we all just get like nothing it's so like just seeing those different wins across the world is really empowering and those different strategies and tactics that we can use um that keeps me going 
Yeah, that's, I think that's really helpful, like looking across the country or across the, the, you know, internationally seeing like what's happening in other places. Like it's true. Somebody wins somewhere, like zero waste is having some success. So we're getting policy, recent policies in California. We recently posted a blog about it. There have been like circular economy is coming up in the European Union a lot. Um, there are a lot of communities in um, Kenya, Nigeria that are fighting against Uganda that are fighting against um, you know, waste colonialism, which will be next week's zero waste month interview series topic, which we're really excited about. Um, so yeah, we're looking for the wins. I think that's great to celebrate with each other. Um, coming to the next audience question, um, Steph mentioned, uh, you know, composting as being, you know, an action, like some kind of individual action that folks can take. We have a question specifically about compost. Somebody wants to compost, um, but their backyard is concrete. Uh, their home is between two abandoned houses. Rodents are a worry. There's, they don't have a vehicle available to take the compost somewhere. Um, compost seems to be like really, you know, an easy action, you know, quote unquote, to go zero waste, to help reduce your waste, but it's not available to all of us. Uh, what do we do? Uh, good question. Uh, there's services that exist, but again, that means you're paying for it. So that's another um, question about access. So uh, when I first moved here, I found the nearest community garden so and I, and I was able to bike to it. So that was like my, my simple solution. But again, it's location, where's your accessibility? So, and there's services that exist, small, small scale, but we're, that's why organizations like Shoshana's are organizing for like, a big scale city supported that gets everyone access to to support to have compost. Yeah, that's exactly right, Steph. You know, trying to of course there is two different things. There's like this individual thing. What can you do now while fighting for this this other thing of like getting uh, composting on a bigger scale? So it'll be for every household, no matter what your house look like, right? It whether it's an apartment, whatever. Um, I think for now, you know, there is little compost bins that you can get um, that you can sit outside and you just roll them. Um, I think that that would probably be the best option for you only because like, um, you know, I mean, we have those at our lots um, for residents to be able to drop theirs off and then we collect it and take it to like the city, like Pollitt. Um, and so I think that would be the next thing. You can buy them. There is some that's actually sold a lot of places, but, but if you, ooh, Definitely not about to say that because I don't like that company. But you can get them at a lot of places if you just Google it. Um, try to find one, you know, at a local shop somewhere. Not Amazon, but a local shop. But that somewhere. sounds like a great opportunity to get your community together to start one that everyone can participate in. That's what one of the communities in Baltimore did. In Volleyville, that was a community that we talked to and tried to get them involved in the fight of, like, getting composting on a local level. And they were like, let's just show the city it can happen, right? And so they went all out. Their composting thing is better than ours. Like, it's literally tracking the amount of food waste through a, a QR code. I was like, wait a minute. We ain't tell you to go show off now. We just say it, collect it. But, um, I know. They, they went and got a grant. They went and got a grant, and now they have access for their whole community. They've got five large bins. <laughs> There are a couple composting grants that's out that you can get and you can use them for communities. Um, that's how they're paying. And they got like the local, uh, the person that picks up from like universities or whatever, like he picks that part up for them. And so there's a lot of different ways you can go. That sounds amazing. Yeah. So we've got, if you have, you know, some funds, uh, you can get like a, one of the rolling compost bins. They seem to close pretty well as far as like rodents and animals go. So that's an option. Um, if you have time, uh, maybe organize with your community, maybe start a community composting system. That would be great. Um, if you don't have any of those, just comment to your neighbors. I think like, wouldn't it be great if we had a composting system? Hey, yeah, it would be cool if we could like, you know, reduce our food waste and, and start that conversation and then get that community together and at your next meeting, right. Or, or write a letter to your mayor or, you know, whatever that next process would be like starting out talking with your neighbors. Like we want to compost. Um, actually, I only just got composting this year, so I was really excited about it. Um, our, our city started um, a composting pilot program, and they put a bin out 
it's like almost right in front of my house. I was so excited, but then you had to go through the process of getting the key and making sure the case, you know, they don't, they want some control. Like we can't just have anything go in the compost bin. Um, so it was a little bit of a process, but I was really excited to be, to be joining the, the pilot program and it looks like they're expanding. So that's really exciting. And that comes from top-down policy. That's been specifically policy um, from the European Union that has come, I live in Spain, so that has come from, uh, you know, really high up and is gradually being implemented community-wise. Um, so we can get changes from the grassroots level, as Shoshanda was talking about, like communities just do it, or um, we can really, you know, fight for those high-level policies and then have it come down and like be implemented through our, our local governments. So all of the options are available to you. Try to utilize all of those channels for Zero Waste Month and throughout the year. All right. And our next question will be our final one, I think. Um, so the last one will be one action that our audience can take for Zero Waste Month. So the key point for Zero Waste Month is that everybody has an action to take um, and we can be a lot of the things that we've been talking about this whole hour so far. Um, but if you had to choose one action to really push for, you know, for our audience members in whatever community that they're living in, um, what should we be aiming for? What action can we take? I'm going to go first, Steph, so that you can you can go middle. Um, I'm going to say something that I think has kind of been said already, but like strike up a conversation with a neighbor about waste. Just do it, you know, see what happens. Uh, find your local zero waste organization and volunteer. <laughs> Um, I was going to say that one, Steph. Um, I would challenge you to reach out to youth, like get out there and talk with them. Like they want, they, they, they have a lot of ideas. So like also include them in those conversations. And if I can say one more thing, the Compost Collective is in Baltimore. It is a youth led organization. Um, it started actually in the movement of Free Your Voice where they wanted to take out a portion of the waste stream. So he started doing composting and teaching it to youth. Um, shout out to Marvin. Hey, is this his name? Um, and that is a service that you have to pay for. For, of course, because like the baby's got to get paid too. There it is. He's in a couple communities. He's not in all of the Baltimore communities. But you know, if he was to scale in the way that we are talking about, then he would be. Um, and so that is just one thing that I want to mention because I saw it somewhere in the comments. So yeah, support your local business. So there's a couple of small scale businesses offering that service. So yeah, support your local business offering conference okay. services. Yeah, I also want to add in find out where your waste goes. If you don't know, where does it go? Does it go to an incinerator? Which one? Yeah, I think starting with, with education is a huge component. Um, so as we mentioned, every local place, every municipality has a different method of dealing with waste. Um, and so finding out what the method is where you live is a big part of knowing what's happening and being able to move to the next thing, right? Um, does your community have a landfill? Does your community have an incinerator? Where does your trash go? Is your recycling um, going to the recycling market or is it highly contaminated and getting thrown into a landfill despite our best efforts? Um, I think that's something to definitely look into. And then I will give everyone a minute or two. Y'all said those really fast. So we have a little more time than I expected. A minute or two to say uh, just whatever you want to say for the last two minutes to, to close out. Like, what's your call to action? What's your, you know, best practice? Whatever it is that you feel like you want to give to the people, give that to the people. Who's going first? <laughs> okay, all right then. And then, uh, yeah, we'll do uh, Shoshana bring us home. <laughs> so, um, you know, I live the, the lifestyle every day. And again, that's only something that I can do as an individual. Uh, but I, I set that example, I bring my reuse container with me everywhere. So 
and I've been making my reels for Zero Waste Month. Thanks for the inspiration. <laughs> and I just show what the interaction is like um, as far as, and that, and that is an education piece for businesses to be like, hey, the community here wants to do this. And then it's also showing others like, hey, I can do that too. I can bring my own container in. So um, that's what I do. Um, that's the easiest thing is come prepared, bring all your stuff with you. And that is that action. That's what shows others that, that future is possible. And in that future that we're advocating for zero waste, like it's behavior change and it's system change. And again, we all have a part to play. I can go next. Um, I would say um, definitely do your, we it was talked about a little bit, but doing your homework around like what's in your community, even looking at the where your waste goes, but also looking at what types of like, like actions and things that's already happening in your community, because most likely something is happening that you can support. Um, so just do that lay of the land. Um, I think that also just knowing even if you're the first one that say something or start something, that's OK. A movement starts with one person like and, and it's going to be built. So like um, if you know you're on the right side, of like what you're doing, just keep doing it. Um, be inspired that like it will follow, like the winds will follow. And sometimes it takes time. So be patient with yourself, be patient with others, um, you know, because like this stuff is hard um, and it is frustrating, especially when, uh, as Jung said earlier, like these health impacts, like your neighbor is still suffering. Like through even all of this time that you're fighting, like these people are still suffering. There are kids in the school that I work with that suffer from asthma, but they still come and they still do this work, right? Um, and so you have to be patient with yourself and be patient with others. And everyone can't always show up. So like, don't feel disappointed in them. Like, it's just, life is happening. Um, but trusting if you can be that person that show up, just show up, just keep showing up repeatedly. Um, and then, you know, sometimes like your city officials will get tired of you and then they're gonna try to give you something of a win. So just don't be afraid to like get on a couple people nerves. Do not be afraid, it's okay. Uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna break a couple egos and that's all right. Um, that's what we need in this, this system of to democracy. Use your power, use your words. I feel like I want to let us end on Shoshanda's. Come on, Young. I'm sure you've got something amazing to say. What's your word to the people? Post Landfill Action Network. Bring it in. Uh, our theory of change, I'll just say that. It's that nobody can do um, everything, but everybody can do something. And together we can fix a broken system. I think that's great. Everybody can do something. And that is a perfect mantra for hashtag zero waste month. So hopefully everybody does something like hopefully you feel inspired after this conversation, you go out in your community, do something and share it with us. Use the hashtag zero waste month and let us know what you did out in your community or what you plan to do or what you were too scared to do because you might not have the strength or courage to do it. We're here to motivate you and we're here to celebrate your wins and we're here to be with you in those times of loss. Um, it happens. Like join the race to zero waste. It's a it's an ultra marathon and sometimes it's hard, but but we're all here and we're hopeful. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to Steph from the Energy Justice Network and uh, Clean Air Baltimore Coalition. Thanks to Shashanda um, from the Balt South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Is that it? Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> and from Young from the Post Landfill Action Network. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being here. Um, we had a great conversation. Hopefully all of our audience members feel inspired. Um, and be sure to share the link with friends, family, coworkers, enemies, <laughs> um, so that everybody can be, uh, a leader in their community or at least start conversations with your neighbors. So thanks all. We'll end there and see you on the next one. It'll be on Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So join us. Bye.